Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. On today's show, Tom and I have so much to talk about. Today, we've lined up a few very interesting topics, such as the Beenomics Project, whether or not commercial bees are putting wild ones at risk, the rise in honey production, and a new UMass research on the impact of pesticides on food safety. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, June. Tom, the weather could not be more perfect. Not exactly Christmas-like, but the weather has really been quite nice. And... A lot of people are talking about how this will impact the overwintering of the bees. So could you just share with our listeners what the weather is like in your neck of the woods and what your opinion is as far as this warm spell? Well, we have wide swings in the weather throughout the winter here in the lee side of the Rockies, and we've just gone through several days of pretty warm weather, but high winds. We get downslope winds, and as those winds come down off the mountains, they compress and they warm up. So where our nights had been in the low 20s, the uh, last few nights, it's been around 60 throughout the night. During the day, it uh, gives the bees a chance to reorganize a little bit within the hive. They can't fly much in this wind, and they they don't go very far. They stay home. But it's a, it gives them an opportunity to to reorganize the cluster, maybe move to fresh comb, to carry out the dead bodies, do a little housekeeping. These downslope winds, we call them Chinooks, are usually followed by a snowstorm, and we expect snow to move in sometime tomorrow evening. Thanks, Tom. Now, the first topic that we're going to talk about today is referred to as the Beenomics Project. And basically, it's a quest by scientists in Canada for the ultimate Canadian honeybee. Now, featured in this article is a friend of ours, Tibor Sabo. Apparently, what this scientist is trying to do at York University what they claim to do is they're trying to create a honeybee that's resistant to disease and also hardy enough to withstand the cold winters. A lot of people are talking about this saying that they're trying to genetically modify the honeybee. What's your opinion, Tom? Well, as I understand this approach, it's not quite as freaky as it may seem at first blush. And uh, beekeepers have tried for generations to adapt their bees to different climates and different tasks. There was an era when we were producing strains that we thought were better pollen collectors, pollen bees, and and they were used in pollination. Um, As I understand it, what they're doing is they're using their ability to read the gene sequence to select colonies that will be crossed naturally. So it's not, uh, it seems to be a pretty sensible approach to creating a better bee. Selective selective breeding, but directed by reading of the genetic code of individual colonies of bees. In the article, which actually appeared in the Star, Tipper Zabo, who is a third-generation beekeeper, and he's been on the show a number of times, and he's currently the president of the Ontario Beekeepers Association. He's in support of it. 
they quoted him. He said that it's the best news he's heard in years. Apparently, he lost almost 60% of his colony in the winter of 2013. So the beekeeping community is really very vulnerable right now. And if scientists can actually do something to help them, I agree. I think it is a good thing. Well, I think the I think the selective breeding is always helpful, but I there's a certain misdirection here that isn't really obvious until you take a look a little closer look. Um, what's being overlooked is the environment in which these bees are going out into, and it's my observation that it's heavily poisoned and in effect hostile to life and if I'm anywhere near correct and I'm not the only one that believes this but what we're attempting to do is create a healthier and healthier bee and send it out into an environment where it's doomed where it cannot survive and I've seen that in a number of the articles that we'll be talking about this afternoon various problems that a colony of bee faces and almost exclusively avoid the issue of pesticides and it's a huge issue with the survival of honeybees and and while it's important that we try to improve the stock I think we need to pay close attention to the environment that we've created that that stock is going to try to survive in thanks Tom which brings us to the next topic there's an article that appeared in Elsevier and it's titled, How Commercial Bees Are Putting Wild Ones at Risk. Researchers call for regular screening for parasites to prevent the spread of disease. Now, once again, this is so typical. Blame the commercial beekeepers instead of looking at the real problem, which is the systemic pesticides. I can't get over that this is just another attempt to blame the commercial beekeepers for problems that are current with other pollinators. The original problem was with the bumblebees, and bumblebee pollination is a relatively new uh, effort, and it, they're used fairly uh, extensively in the production of greenhouse tomatoes. A bumblebee colony will work effectively in a greenhouse, whereas a colony of honeybees won't. The bumblebees also do what's called buzz pollinating. They vibrate their wings at just the proper frequency to cause the tomato flower to, it's called dehize or shed its pollen. So they're very effective for tomato pollination. But when the uh, production of bumblebee colonies began, as I understand it, it began in Europe, and then they were shipped over to the United States, and they brought with them diseases to which North American uh, bumblebees had not developed any resistance. So there was a very significant uh, disease problem introduced by that technology, that bumblebee uh, production and and importation. To a lesser degree, I, I think the managed honeybees are involved, but I haven't seen much... Uh, evidence that they are uh, a vector in the contamination of wild bees. I think that, as you said, June, the pesticide environment is far more important to the survival of all those bees, both wild and managed. Not to mention other species. How many articles are we going to see where the beekeepers are blamed and nothing is mentioned about the systemic pesticides? When you take a look at the overwhelming amount of scientific research that has been independently conducted, peer-reviewed, and published, and folks, the reason that that's so important is because when it's independently conducted research, nobody is paying for a desirable outcome. Number two, when it's peer-reviewed, you're talking about other scientists reviewing, critiquing, analyzing, and commenting on the research to make sure that it's sound research. That's what makes the difference between the paid research, which has a desirable outcome, and the independently conducted research, which is basically pure science. So there's a big difference. 
And that's why this type of research really matters. And the fact that we have so many papers, so many of the world's top scientists that are continuing to research the impact of neonicotinoids on our pollinators and have repeatedly showed the impact, the devastation. And then we have something like this, which once again goes back to the same old thing that industry keeps spewing, which is it's the beekeeper's fault. You know, generations of people who have been caring for bees are obviously doing it wrong. It's preposterous, Tom. Well, not only do they blame the beekeepers, but they'll blame anything that they can come up with. And a prime candidate has been the varroa mite. There's been a considerable focus on the effects of the varroa mite, and, and experienced beekeepers wouldn't dismiss the varroa. They're not only blaming the beekeepers, but they're blaming anything that they can come up with, and a prime candidate is the varroa mite. And certainly any experienced beekeeper would tell you that the varroa is something that needs to be dealt with on a regular basis, and beekeepers who do this for a livelihood do that. They, that's one of the the elements of their business that they tend to. And they'll tell you that they have the varroa pretty much in control. It's the pesticides that are causing these huge, huge losses. And many of the articles that you've seen, much of the research that's coming out, uh, very carefully avoids the question of pesticides. It's, uh, it's very perplexing and frustrating because as far as I can see, this really is the most massive poisoning of the environment, certainly for the life forms at the lower end of the food chain, that we have ever seen. And I've, I've said repeatedly on this program, it represents approximately the toxic equivalent of 600, and 600 billion pounds of DDT every year, year after year, I've said that repeatedly, and I've yet to get a single challenge to those figures. Because you're right. Well, I'd like to think so, and, and even if I'm off by a factor of 10, it's an enormous poisoning of the environment with, with compounds that are water-soluble, long-lived, and which accumulate in the environment contaminate the soil, migrate with the groundwater. Everywhere that they've been looked for, they've been found. Now, if you take a look at some of the similarities, and I'm just saying, just consider it. Think about the computer industry, all the computer viruses, all of the antivirus software that claim that so many new viruses are being found every minute of the day. And yet, they come up with new solutions. Isn't that convenient? Just like with the problems that we're seeing in horticulture, actually. Now, there's a problem that's affecting roses. And there's been talk about genetically modifying the rose. The rose industry is huge. Wouldn't that be a cash cow? Well, there has been talk about genetically engineering the honeybee as well, uh, facetiously referred to as the Roundup Ready Bee. Uh, what better response would you have to this uh, chemical form of agriculture that's being pushed in the United States and many other countries than to eliminate the pollinator problem by, by bioengineering a bee that's resistant to all these chemicals? And I suppose next it's the Roundup Ready human being. Tom, you may just be their next... Their next target. <laughs> Roundup ready, Tom. Yeah. But seriously, I don't subscribe to conspiracy theories, and I always look for the scientific proof. It just behooves me that we see this time and time again. Somebody recently told me that the tulip, the white tulip and the variegated tulip, and I haven't had a chance to investigate this further, but that came about basically because of a virus. So it's interesting how many problems human beings have created for both horticulture and agriculture alike, and then have come up with a solution that is quite profitable. That is basically stating the obvious. As far as the intricate details, that's for you to decide, folks.
this article, it disturbed me because, once again, it's putting the blame on the beekeepers, which is so easy to do because they don't really have a strong front. They can't compete with industry's very deep pockets, and they're disappearing rapidly. It just makes me wonder how much longer are commercial beekeepers going to be around, and how is industry going to figure out what they can do to profit from that loss? One of the efforts is for corporations to purchase beekeeping operations, and the uh, the major move there was on the part of Paramount Farms when they bought out David Mendez two years ago, to the, and it amounted to about 20,000 colonies. I don't know how that's working for them, but I think what they'll find is that it isn't as easy as they think it may be. Um, we are losing beekeepers. We've, I have friends who are no longer beekeepers who once were, were very successful commercial beekeepers. It's a very sad situation, um, and it's not going to get better because I don't see any change taking place. The EPA has done little or nothing. In fact, they are accelerating the problem. They've become the cheerleader for this chemical form of agriculture. Um, it does not look it does not look good for the beekeepers, the future. This next article really is very confusing because it's claiming that there's a rise in honey production. Tom, you explain this one to me. Yeah, that's very interesting. And if you know a little bit about beekeeping and the environment that bees uh, profit from or not, the uh, the uh, statistics coming out of Canada are very interesting, and they would like us to believe that everything is ducky, that the honey production has improved, and colony count is up by like 3.6%, which is irrelevant, really. But if you look at the statistics, the increase in production has come from the prairie provinces, Okay. And the prairie provinces are an extension of North and South Dakota. And this is a wide, extensive band of yellow sweet clover. And yellow sweet clover is one of the finest honey producing plants there is. And in a clover year, the bees are bringing it in by the bucket load. And it appears that that's what's happened. The increase in production has been in the prairie provinces. I believe Alberta production is up by over 20%, for example. Now, if you go back east to Ontario and Quebec, I think you'd find the statistics were not quite as favorable. So the people who want to minimize the effect of the pesticides in Canada have capitalized on this increased production, and it, it is an increased production, but it's because there apparently has been an extensive clover bloom in the prairie provinces. So in other words, this isn't indicative of commercial migratory beekeepers. This is not something that's as the result of the efforts of commercial beekeepers, but rather the result of bees that are foraging in the prairie lands and whatnot. It, it's, it's a result of the benefit of Mother Nature. This was a good year, apparently, in the prairie provinces, and uh, that's clover country. Now, the canola, that's canola country as well, and maybe canola entered in there also, but... This is just a favorable year. It is not necessarily an indicator of the short or long-term health of the industry. Thanks, Tom. And the last topic that I'd like to talk about is in regards to a new project that's taking place at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Basically, there's a new study that's going on in which a food scientist is going to look at how pesticides affect food safety. Now, this is something we've really been waiting for. Yes, it's very interesting. Uh, there's been little or nothing done that I'm aware of on the effect of the neonicotinoids in the diet. And they have become quite pervasive because they're the most widely used pesticides 
ever. Then it will be very interesting to see what this researcher comes up with. Well, according to the press release, the food scientist and analytical chemist Lily He received four hundred seventy three thousand six hundred twenty eight dollars in grant money from the USDA. So that's really interesting that USDA is actually funding this. The study will focus on how chemical pesticides applied both systemically and to the surface penetrate fresh produce and move into plant tissue and how this may affect food safety for consumers. So this will be very interesting and I just wonder, will this remain a pure study and will industry try to sabotage it? It's an interesting selection of plants. The apple, the grape, and spinach are the three plants that they're going to be working with. And they've selected those because of the differences in the skin of those plants, the, the fruit. Apple has a, a, a rind uh, that can be peeled away. Grapes have a very thin skin. And spinach has virtually no skin at all. And what one of the things that they want to research is the penetration of the pesticides into the plant. When you get into the systemics, you're in a whole new realm because that's the nature of those chemicals. They are systemic. They get into the system of the plant. And it would be very interesting to see what those levels are in commodity crops like corn or soybeans, where the neonicotinoids, the systemic pesticides are used extensively, and those are primary building blocks in all sorts of foods. So I, I think that we may find some things by looking at apples, grapes, and spinach, but that's not a, a, a basic element in the American diet. Well, I think another point is also the fact that apples are widely used for apple juice as a sweetener, there's so many different applications for apples and even with grapes. With the spinach, considering the fact that spinach is something that's basically washed and consumed, it is consumed cooked, but for the most part, most people think of spinach as consuming it raw. It'll be very interesting to see what the results contain. Yes, it will be. Well, Tom, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. And as always, it's a very interesting exploration into the world that we live in today and how it's being impacted by these chemicals. So thank you for taking the time to join me this week. Well, Dewan, you're welcome. And, you know, we've said this before, but I want to thank you for going through the sacrifices that you do to provide this outlet for these kinds of discussions. We really are the only ones who are talking about this, and uh, we may not be talking heads, but we do the best we can to bring this information to the public so that they can understand what's going on here. These are very serious questions that go far beyond the bees. So thanks for providing an outlet for these issues. Thanks, Tom. And, you know, I couldn't do it without you because you provide the insight that I think a lot of folks need to hear, especially coming from a commercial beekeeping perspective. Now, folks, if you have any questions, please write to us at questions at com, or you can find me on Twitter and tweet your questions there to me at June Stoyer. Tune in next week as Tom and I continue to explore the impact of neonicotinoids. Have a great afternoon, everyone. This is June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show.